The Estuary by Margaret St. Clair The best of it was that it wasn't really stealing. Everybody knew that the ships had been moored in the estuary because mooring them was cheaper than cutting them up for scrap metal would have been. There was a guard and a patrol at night, of course, but both were perfunctory and negligent. Evading them was so easy as to make abstractions seem rather more legitimate than they would have if the ships had been unguarded entirely. No wonder Pickard thought of his thefts as a sort of praiseworthy salvaging. Night after night, he scrabbled in the bowels of the rotting Liberty ships and came up with sheets of metal, parts of instruments, and lengths of brass and copper pipe. He had a friend in the boat-building business who bought most of what he appropriated and who paid him prices which were only a shade below normal. Once in a while, pictures of what would happen to him if he were caught bothered Pickard. He rather thought the ships were government property and carried a proportionate penalty, but those apes on the patrol made so much noise on their rounds that you'd have to be deaf, dumb, and blind to get caught. Business was good. After the first three months, Pickard found it expedient to hire a helper, a tall, gangling youth who wore a felt skullcap and was called Jean. He took over with no difficulty at all Pickard's belief that his occupation was, at worst, one of the slight necessary irregularities which keep the wheels of business lubricated and revolving steadily. He was a smart boy in other ways, too. After he had worked for Pick for three or four days, he suggested a number of improvements in the salvaging technique. They were well thought of. That week, Pickard's receipts were some 120% above their previous average. A modest prosperity visited the Pickard household. Estelle took to cooking with butter instead of margarine. She read advertisements for fur coats with a puckered brow and a critical eye. Uh, say, Pop, Jean said hesitatingly two or three weeks after Estelle had made the down payment on a medium-priced Persian lamb greatcoat. You ever heard anything on these boats at night? I mean, anything funny? Pick looked at him quizzically. The night was hazy and overcast, with a good deal of diffused light in the sky, and he could discern, though dimly, the outline of Jean's head and face beside him in the motorboat. Don't get cold feet, he said. That patrol won't bother us none. Those dumb bastards wouldn't know manure if they fell in it. Jean wriggled. He was still very young. I don't mean the patrol, he answered. I mean something, uh, kind of funny. Something on the boats like it was following me. Pickard laughed. You got too much imagination, Junior he said, that Junior was his revenge for Jean's calling him Pop, which he detested. Nothing here but a lot of worn-out boats. You're young and full of... Okay, Jean said. I just... Okay. See if you can get some more of that little brass tubing, Pick said as they parted. He shoved a hunk of snus into his cheek. Bert told me he could use any amount of it. Okay. Artistically speaking, Jean should have disappeared that night. It was not until Friday, however, that he failed to show up at the motorboat with his load of salvage and scrap. Pick waited for him impatiently at first, then with anxiety. What could have happened to the kid? He might have gotten into a tangle with the patrol, of course, but Pick hadn't heard any disturbance, and sound carries well over water. Patrol always went around with lanterns and flashlights and made much more noise than a kaffir latch. But if Jean hadn't got into trouble with the patrol, where was he? Had he fallen somewhere clambering around in the dark? Was he lying unconscious in the bottom of some hold? Before the lightning sky forced him home, Pickard hunted for the boy on a handful of ships. He found no sign of him. He hunted the next night and the next and the next, not forgetting, of course, his primary interest in salvage, until he had covered every hull in the slowly rocking graveyard of them. No Jean. Only on the third hull he visited on the last night, he found the boy's felt skullcap floating brim up in a sheet of filthy bilge. Pickard was worried. 
more worried than he would have cared to admit. If Jean had been hauled off by the patrol, it meant trouble for Pick himself sooner or later. And if the patrol wasn't responsible for his absence, what was? Estelle noticed his trouble and questioned him until she forced the reason for it from him. At the end of his account, she laughed. He was a kind of jerk, Pick, she said comfortingly. What happened was he got scared and ran and then was ashamed to come back and tell you about it afterwards. Just a jerk. Yeah, but what scared him? Pick swallowed. I remember hearing, he said with some difficulty, about how there was a wilder got welded up in one of those ships when they was building them. They launched the ship with him in it, and then there was a man down in the bottom of his air hose caught fire and... His wife snorted. That's a lot of horse hair, Pick, and you know it. I never heard such junk. You scared of the patrol? Uh-uh. Well, then, I don't know what's the matter with you. I sure never thought you'd lose your nerve. Mabel was telling me they lied off Reese at Selby yesterday. Estelle was thinking, Pickard knew, of the payments on her new fur coat. Pickard slept in the daytime and worked at night. And though it was a quiet neighborhood, he never slept very well. He had been asleep three or four hours, which brought the time to 11 a.m. when he had his dream. It started out mildly enough. He was hunting through one of the hulls for a highly sellable chunk of Everdur he had reason to believe was somewhere about. As he hunted, he began to have a feeling, faint at first and then stronger, that something pretty unpleasant was lurking on the periphery of his vision. Two or three times he turned around abruptly, hoping to surprise it, but it moved faster than he could. He kept on looking for the Everdur. He climbed up ladders and down them again, sniffed around in the engine room and the crew's quarters. At last, in the bilge of number three hold, he saw the half-submerged piece of Everdur. As soon as he saw it, he forgot that he had been hunting it. By the strange equivalence of dreams, it was the bilge, the filthy, stinking bilge, which became the object of his desire. He knelt down beside it, scooped it up in his hand, and, nauseating, sick with disgust and self-loathing, began to drink. Pick's heart was beating violently when he awoke. Of all the dumb dreams, what did a thing like that mean? What sense was there to it? His pulse was still pounding abnormally when the noon whistles blew. He hired another helper. Fred wasn't nearly as good as Jean had been, a lazy bum, in fact, and he quit after five days, saying he didn't like the noises on the hulls at night. So you can see, Pick had plenty of warning before it happened to him. It was a week later that Jean came up behind him, where he was between the decks on the MS Blunt, and pawed at him with his rotting hands. Pick screamed and screamed and tried to fight him off, but he was wholly unsuccessful. He couldn't hurt Jean. Jean was already dead. And then Pick was floundering around in the sickening, stinking, loathsome, wonderful bilge, while Jean stood over him, making soft, blubbering noises with his peeling, oozing lips, and the other one lurked quietly in the background. Estelle never did get finished paying for her fur coat. After a while, she set up housekeeping with a man named Leon Soker, who had long admired her. The ships went back to their slow job of rotting at their mooring without bothering the taxpayers. And nowadays, if you are so indiscreet as to go poking at night among the rotting hulls as they rot quietly at anchor in the estuary, you will find that they are populated by a small, select company, a company consisting of Pickard, Jean, and the Welder, who is the oldest inhabitant. <laughs>